Welcome to our March Global to Local Speaker Series and part two of our National Social Work Symposium Month. Today I have Dr. Amanda Jeremiah with me all the way from Arizona. Dr. Amanda Jeremiah graduated from, with her PhD in higher education from the Center of U Arizona Center of the Study of Higher Education in May 2021. Her dissertation entitled The Indigenous Revolt in Education, Indigenous Feet, a Scholar Pace, was awarded the 2022 Outstanding Contribution to Indigenous Higher Education Research Award from the Student Affairs and Administration in Higher Education, NASPA, Indigenous Peoples Knowledge Community. She was also awarded the 2020 Native American 40 Under 40 by the National Center for by the National Center for American Indian Enterprise Development. Dr. Sharmayo cares deeply about giving back to Indigenous students and communities. She centers Indigenous methodologies and ways of knowing through visual narratives. Dr. Sharmayo has been a part of the Native SOAR since the program's inception in 2005. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Sharmayo. I want to make sure that you can see my presentation for folks online. Do you have to, you have to share the screen? Okay. All righty. So in this uh, Zoom land world, it's always quite fascinating to navigate technology and be in person. Um, so, all right. So folks online, they can see now? Is that right? Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you so much for joining. Um, this is blocking my view. <laughs> okay. Hopefully this won't block too much. <laughs> All right. Well, um, Buati Seo Hopa, Kautuisa, Eshashka, Tana Hanusta, Guishi Sao, Bahopa, Shoba Wisha, Tasha, Nashi, Ashawa Matsani. Um, it's quite a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I just introduced myself and my traditional language called Keras. It's an ancient language spoken um, by tribal peoples um, from the Laguna Pueblo, as well as other surrounding communities in New Mexico. And um, so I'm so honored to be here with all of you today. It's a pleasure to travel up to the Northeast. Um, it's definitely colder here. Um, we went to uh, the um, Niagara Falls yesterday and the, the border agent coming back in was like, looking at our passports and stuff. And he's like, no wonder you're from Arizona. That's why you're all bundled up. And it's like, I guess we stick out because it definitely is different because uh, it's winter at 7 a.m. in the morning in Arizona and it gets spring about 2 o'clock p.m. in uh, Tucson. So, um, so yeah, it's a, a different um, place to be here, but it's such a warm and welcoming community and we're so honored to be here. My friend Alex Higuera is here. Can you wave, Alex? So uh, he's uh, traveling with me. Um, so we... Um, work together at the University of Arizona. He's a great friend and also a fellow storyteller. So I thought it'd be cool to, uh, for him to come along. Um, so uh, first, I think it's very important to recognize the traditional homelands in which we are on. In Tucson, Arizona, the University of Arizona resides on the traditional homelands of the Thana Atan and Pascoyaki people. Um, and uh, Pascoyaki is actually the tribal nation that Alex is from. Um, so we recognize that being up here in the Northeast, um, Okay, so this, I'm gonna try my best here. <laughs> that the um, Wenra Rohana Han and the Hori Nasani um, traditional homelands of the, the ancestral people here. I think that's always important to recognize and to acknowledge as we navigate spaces um, within um, the institution and beyond. I think it's very important to uh, recognize there's an awesome website here um, to, uh, if you look at this website, you can put in any um, community um, and it'll show you the traditional homelands of which the indigenous nations have inhabited. So I think that's awesome resource. Um, giving light acknowledgements is extremely important, I believe, because um, our, our people have been here since time immemorial before uh, contact and before um, our, our, our stories of our people are so connected within North America and beyond. So I think that's very important to recognize as we move into different spaces. Um, so a little bit more about me. Um, as mentioned, I graduated last year. Um, it is extremely hard to earn a degree in the pandemic. 
If you are a student, I want to honor you and I want to recognize you. I know that you're doing wonderful and we're cheering and we're rooting for you because it, as all of us know, has rocked our world in so many ways. Um, and finishing a PhD in the pandemic was extremely hard. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that in that space here. Um, in the middle is my uh, great grandmother, Kalt Dewey. So I introduced myself um, at the beginning, Kalt Dewey Sta. So I am called Kalt Dewey. Um, and this is my great great grandmother. Um, it's amazing that we have a picture of her. This was early in the early 1900s. Um, but I want to recognize that this was taken last year. This was taken in the early 1900s. Um, and our traditional regalia is called a manta, and the pieces of it are reflected still here 100 years earlier. And I think that just shows um, the resiliency. It shows um, the stamina, the endurance of our traditional people and our language and our culture. Um, and then on the right is uh, my mom, Dr. Raleen J. Ross in the middle, and my sister, uh, Meredith Ch uh, Chermaya Salazar. And so my mom is a clinical psychologist. Um, she graduated from the University of North Dakota um, a few years ago. Um, and so my sister is in the clinical um, psychology program at the University of Alaska Anchorage. So I come from a very long line of family members who have gone to college, which is um, very rare, um, especially for indigenous communities. Um, but I like to acknowledge that heritage and that lineage. Um, and my auntie June actually went to school um, in Ithaca, New York, and I got her um, law degree there over there at Cornell. So it's, um, so it's cool to have this, this lineage um, with my uh, family. Um, a little bit more that's important to know about me is that I'm a photographer. Um, so I, um, it's interesting because I started shooting um, photography on my phone and at the time it was an iPhone 4. <laughs> and so that was in 2009 and that's where I learned my, my passion and um, my, my ability to tell stories on a phone began and really in 2009 and that's um, I hope it encourages all of you that you don't have to have fancy equipment um, to share your story. Um, a lot of us have access to a uh, smartphone or tablets um, or laptops where we can share our stories. Um, and it's also important to know too that I have a visual impairment. So I'm not gonna be looking at you in your eyes because I can't see your eyes. <laughs> and so uh, I don't know how this works. I think it's quite, I think you call, I call it a miracle. I'm not quite sure how I can take photographs and I'm not sure how I can see some of these things because I can see it, but I can't see. So it really is a miracle, I don't know how to describe it. Um, so during the presentation, I will be flipping back and forth between slides um, and different websites. Um, I just know that, that it may take me a little bit of time to transition through. Um, but it's fascinating because throughout the presentation, I'll be sharing some of the photography that I've taken. Um, and again, I, I don't, I don't know how this works, <laughs> like to, to be a partially blind photographer, I have no central vision. So if I look at an object, um, like I know that there's a there's a post right there, right? But if I look at the top, it completely goes away. Um, like if I look at Hillary, if I look at your head, it completely goes away. So I don't really know. It's it's fascinating. I don't quite know how this works, but I think that's a very important part of my identity because um, I do um, identify as a person with other abilities. Um, I'm not a big fan of the word disability because I believe it's different abilities. Um, but um, yeah, so it's a little bit about me. Um, and I wanted to just show here on the screen um, Laguna Pueblo. So this is the state of New Mexico and the Zoom faces are kind of in the way, but it's okay, the state of New Mexico. Um, and so Laguna is located right here, um, a little bit west of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, so fun fact, Secretary Deb Holland um, is from my same tribal community, which I think is awesome. It's such a cool connection. Like I think about like out of all the 500 and something tribal nations in our country, how is it that a person from the Pueblos is one in one of the most um, well-known positions in our, in our country? And I think there's a lot in that, um, but I think it's very special that she is from our Pueblo community. Um, and I run a program called Native SOAR. Um, here are the handles here at Native SOAR. So we value and center amplifying the narratives of our indigenous people. And so we have a very active 
um, social media, so I'd like to put that on there. But this is the team that I work with. Um, Maria and Jeremiah are both Diné Navajo from um, the northern part of Arizona. They both come from rural communities. So our, our outreach um, really tries to engage our indigenous communities, both in urban and rural um, communities all across the southwest of, um, of our country. Um, so I always like to give a plug. Um, so for I do a lot of scholarship work with um, indigenous folks, but um, here's a poster which I actually brought um, here and I'll be sharing some of the photography work that I'm doing or have done. Um, but this is a list of different scholarships designed for indigenous students. Um, and a lot of times when you're trying to figure out how to pay for school, families are like, I just need a list. And so I always kind of give this commercial break um, here, but I also, a big part of the journey is as a graduate student and as a master's, um, sorry, master's student and PhD student, um, I also uh, earned over $85,000 in scholarships to finish school debt free. So I like to mention that because there is scholarship money to help pay for students and it takes work to go and do that. But a lot of this money was a function of learning how to tell my story on paper. So it's really fascinating. Like once you get some mechanism, once you get some of the foundational elements of telling a story, there's so many ways that it can transfer to different platforms. Um, so, but the students here, I want to encourage you, this is scholarship season now, um, go buy those scholarships because there's money that people want to invest in you to pay for your schooling. Um, so I think that's always a big uh, message. Uh oh, we're not heading to the quicker Click the bottom, big one, what's happening? That's what you again. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened. Um, all right, so as the clicker is uh, working and trying to figure this out, work now. <laughs> Something when it happened to Zoom, I don't know what. So yeah, as you're figuring that out, um, I think that when you've applied to scholarships to figure out how you put your story on paper. Um, oh yeah. Well, yeah, you can finish that free. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, the, I'm gonna just click it through. If that's okay too. This is now working. Oh, it you works. Cast now one side. Okay. All righty. Okay. Cool. All right. So. Um, yeah, so in today the goal is to learn strategies and to center storytelling that can help you in your work, no matter where you're at or what you're doing. Um, who are students in here out of curiosity? Can you raise your hand? Okay, all right, we got three students. Okay, cool. Um, do, well, I was gonna ask who the students online. <laughs> can you uh, look, Michelle, to see who are, if you're a student online, can you raise your hand or give a heart reaction and kind of just give me a feel, Michelle, of how many students are online? Let's see, there's one. Oh my goodness, three, four, five. Awesome. Seven. About 10. Cool. Yeah. All right, great. Okay, this helps me. All right. Um, so yeah, so so the the core elements of storytelling that I'll share with you will help you students as well as other practitioners and faculty and so forth. Um, so I want to start this presentation off is what does it mean to be a digital caretaker? So who has some ideas? When you hear digital caretaker, what do you think? I think it's an ethical use of um, materials put out in the metaverse, whichever, you know, new story uh, has. So yeah, that's being in the digital world. Okay, yeah, great. Um, what else? Other folks, I'm sure you can have other folks online who comment. I um, truly have no idea, um, but I am my family's historian. Um, and so I document lots of, you know, things from my extended family and my children to pass down to next generations. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Great. <clears throat> Anybody else? Someone in the comments said preservation of images and another person said ethical data stewardship. Ooh. that us as a group is defining and honestly is a new term that I'm just 
figuring out how to emerge within and work within. How this came about, this uh, came about maybe about three weeks ago, um, a few, right before the pandemic, I went to New Zealand on an exchange trip with tribal leaders from Arizona. And we went to visit this one river called the Wanganui River. Very, very special river because within New Zealand, this river has a status as if it was a person. It's very fascinating. Um, and, and as we know, as indigenous people, the elements of the earth and the, in our world are very important and have its own expression, a form of expression in terms of well-being or life or connection. Um, and so so the river, so the river people there are very um, uh, cognizant of how and very protective of how they share their stories. And so I'm making a short digital story about my experience there, but it is taking, uh, there's a lot of steps that I'm taking through. And then this just kind of came out of my mouth when I was talking to the coordinator. I was like, I was like, it's like being a digital caretaker. <laughs> and so I, so that kind of just came out. And I was like, this concept is really fascinating because it involves so many different elements. And so in this context here, um, what I want to describe is what a digital caretaker is. Can I'm sorry, it's a little echoing now. It's not getting so that a little further away. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's all good. You know, we're trying to figure this out. It's all good, you know? In this Zoom space, Zoom University. Okay, so let's try this. All right. Okay, so um, a digital caretaker in this context of the presentation is that it's a preservation of our culture, it's love and respect, it's encouragement in these digital, digital spaces. Honoring accountability and responsibility about what you share, how you share, it, and who you share about. So that is how I'm conceptualizing this digital caretaker. Because when I think of caretaker, um, within our Native Store program, um, Myria, she is the caretaker for her, her two um, nieces and her nephew. And so within our program, we're very cognizant about how we use language. Like when we're um, talking about getting information from parents and from guardians, and we say from caretakers. So we just say caretakers because that, that's all encompassing. So when I think of caretakers, I think about her as a young person. She's a grad student with our program how she takes care of her three teenage um, uh, nieces and nephews. And so I think about her and think about how she, yeah, she loves them. She'll do anything for them, right? There's a sense of this responsibility. And then when I think about digital caretaker, I transfer that concept to thinking like, okay, it's like the curating of your content. It's like you're taking care of your, your story, taking care of your responsibility as a storyteller. Um, so that's how I um, kind of came up with this concept. Um, and so I think that as we begin here, as a storyteller, it's understanding, it's important to understand who you are, um, what you like to do, and what you are passionate about. Um, and I want to begin with this here. Um, this is a photograph from 1884 from the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So Carlisle, Pennsylvania is approximately five hours and 10 minutes from here. Uh, and I want you to look at this photograph. Can you describe to me what you're seeing here in this photograph? Kill the culture, save the child. Okay. Kill the culture, save the child. Uh, sorry, what did you say? Boarding school. Boarding school. Okay, great. Yep. What else? Yes. Erasure of culture. Erasure of culture. All right. Yes, Michelle. Sadness. Sadness. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Anybody online? Sarah said no. Oh, oh. Genocide. Okay. Yeah. If you look at these young people, oh my gosh, they're so clear on this screen. It's, it's amazing. Um, everyone's dressed the same, right? There's no no expression of like sketchers or like, like in the late 1800s, but there's no expression of like a Nike or, you know, anything that we like know, but like in that time, like everybody's the same. Everybody's haircut is the same, right? Like some very short kind of like mine. Um, and everybody, it seems very somber, right? A very somber expression here on these young people. This type of photography, this um, glass plate negative photography, um, you had to have subjects stay there for like 10 to 15 seconds. So you think about the surveillance of these young people, right? When you're when you're that young, right? You're like, 
moving around, right? You're like all wiggly. You're like, ooh, a butterfly, you know? Or like, you know, like, hey, like, you know, talking to your friends, right? But if you imagine, like, how much surveillance they were under to all be in the, that, um, the, these um, different positions, it's a lot of surveillance and a lot of um, control over these young people. Uh, I get a little choked up when I see um, these young people because our relatives were there, right? Like I've had many relatives that have been at Carlisle. Um, and if we look here, this is Tom Torlino. So he's Diné Navajo. Um, and he was a student that went there, but this is one of the most famous photographs of the before and after um, boarding school era photography. Um, so on the left here, who can describe to me some of the characteristics? Traditional. Traditional, okay. What else? Long hair. Long hair, yeah. Great story. Yeah, yeah. Even his skin tone, like he's been outside more on the left. Okay, yeah. So, yep, right. good observation, right? Yeah, the skin tone is, is very dark. Um, and then to the right side here, we have him in a suit, right? The photographer, John Cho, got him in a suit, cut off his hair, right? Not necessarily him, but the school folks in there. Um, and there's this transformation here that has occurred that Henry Pratt, over the, the uh, founder of the school, wanted to communicate like, look, our school is making these changes. They're, they're killing the Indian, right? And they're saving the man, right? Uh, that's the narrative there. That was his like motto there at that school. And so for me, in this time as a storyteller, the why for me is here. Like, I know that our people weren't necessarily um, the photographers at this time. There was one native photographer at the school at the time, um, but they were always the ones being photographed. And so essentially, our people were not necessarily the storytellers, but their stories were always told for them. And so for me now, I know that I'm the storyteller and that I do have access to, photo, uh, to take photographs uh, and take photos, um, and I can amplify the narratives of our people. So that is the why for me personally. So my hope is that for you to figure out why are you sharing your story, because that will absolutely drive everything else for, for you. Um, and I want to share just a little bit more here um, with my website here. So I have this website that I created with uh, Wix. Um, for those students, um, I created it when I was a student. I pay about 250 a school year. Yeah, school year. Um, a year. It's a different screen. Oh, yeah. thank you so much. Can you help me, Rachel? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, for those students that are here, um, so I pay about $250 per year for this website and $25 for the domain name. And I mentioned that because when you think about your digital presence, um, it's important to know, like, do you want a digital presence? What is your imprint going to be? Um, so for me, because I told you my mission, right, is to amplify our narratives and to build the confidence of our people. Is it, oh, I'm sharing now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. Cool. So, um, so I just want you. What what comments? When you just see this picture, what do you think? You know, you won't offend me. Whatever comments you have, what do you think if you were just to see that picture? You see this screen. Is there a comment online? Yeah. Okay. Oh, the cat. This is me thinking of Southwest. Okay. Yeah. What do you think about me? I'm just standing in the desert. <laughs> yeah. It's just radiant. Radiant. Oh, okay. Context. You're in context. context okay. And it seems comfortable and natural. Ah, okay, cool. That's great. Oh, well, that's cool. <laughs> I was going for something like that. Yeah, right. I was like, again, the land for me is so important, right? Uh, so you just go down a little bit more. Um, and so, so right here, um, my purpose here. I'll uh, scroll up a little bit more. I should probably make this bigger, actually, right here. Um, is strengthening the collective and individual self-determination of indigenous people through education, storytelling, digital media, and advocacy. So that's like my LinkedIn profile, right? <laughs> like that's like the, the sentence. But again, I'm telling you a story, right? Like, so students, again, like when you try to figure out like, how do you sell yourself, right? That it's like in resumes or for grad school, right? Much love to Rija, she got into the PhD program. Much love to her, um, right? But it's like, how do you fill up these applications or documents, right? Where you share what you've done. 
And so it's taken several years to figure out how to do that, but you'll get there, right? If you're not already there. Um, and so then, um, if you know what, please, um, go to the balcony page, please. Um, and I just want to share with you real quick. So scroll down. Um, right here, the mission for me. Oh my gosh, this is so small. Can you read this for me? <laughs> it's so tiny on here. Build the confidence of Indigenous people, especially Indigenous youth and college students. Yes. My whole goal in life is to build the confidence of our Indigenous people. How will I do that in the vision? If you go down and read that for me, please. Amplify the narratives of Indigenous people and communities through storytelling and digital media. Perfect. All right. So I hope this kind of gives you a vision of how simple it is to like come up with something like this, right? Like this, if you were to see this, like you would know who I am, right? This is what I care about. Okay. So if you go back to the PowerPoint, please. Um, and so uh, as we go back to the PowerPoint here, all right. So go ahead and scroll down. Okay, cool. I can take it from here. Okay. Hopefully this works. I've lost my uh, clicker. <laughs> All right. Cool, it works. All right. So this is an activity to do later. I do this all the time with students. But Google yourself. <laughs> see what comes up. Look at the images and see what, what comes up there. So when you talk about digital imprints, like I understand that there are some people who do not want to be found. That is cool like that is okay right for security reasons or for personal reasons like that is okay my mom is one of those people she does not want to be found <laughs> she does not want to be in any of my social media campaigns or anything like that and i respect that you know and so but for those that do want to have a, an influence online in these digital uh, platforms this is really important because if people Google you, right, like we do that all the time. If you meet somebody new, I'm sure University of Buffalo Googled me, right, <laughs> before they brought me here, right? Like, let's see who this person is, right? So fun fact, how I got connected to um, this community here was through Richa, through how? TikTok. TikTok, right? You saw one of my TikToks, right? And I'm making it here in my bedroom, right? Making all these TikToks, like, about um, college access, how to pay for college, um, our Native American culture and life. Like, um, so she saw me on TikTok. And then how did you find me? Because I don't have my email online. So how did you find me? I, it's really funny. I went to your Instagram, which had some information about you. So I, look, I looked you up. Okay. I found your website. Okay. There we go. See, look at that. <laughs> right? So you're Googling me, right? Yeah. Right? And that, that's, a, that's a purpose for me, right? Is to put stuff up there where I can be found. Not easily found. I don't want my home address up there, right? Like on TikTok, but like but a way for me to connect professionally, right? With folks like, like Richa and all of you. So it's really cool. Um, so again, yeah, think about that. Like what your digital imprint will be and Google yourself. Um, one way that we've um, at Native Soar have really helped to build the confidence of our people. And this is so simple um, is that we use this activity called kind words. And I want to speak these words to all of you um, and know that you are loved. I hope that you know that you are worthy, that you are smart, that you are creative, that you are important, you are storytellers. Um, and that can translate in so many ways, right? Again, the, 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 the vision and the mission that I have are so intertwined together, but it's to build the confidence of people. So when you're in your work, right? Like you want to build the confidence in social work, right? You're working with people all the time. And how do you get them to open up, right? How do you get to have them share about what's bothering them in some of these areas, right? Like they have to know that they are loved, right? That they feel safe, right? And how do you create those spaces as a practitioner, as a teacher, as a professor, right? And so these words, this is one way we've done it is we speak these words over them. Like you are an innovator, right? You are strong. These are some of the photographs that I've taken over the years. Um, but we made posters out of them that are this size 11 by 17. And so we even have it in their traditional language too, right? And it's so beautiful because, you know, as we work with people, honoring the, the legacies of and the culture of the people that we work with can go a very long way. Um, and so this is written in Hopi. This is my mentee, Seva. He's a cowboy. He's in eighth grade. He has his own sticker business. It's amazing, this, this young man. Um, his sister, Saninka, my, my youngest mentee, she's a kindergartner. She also has her own business. She does tie-dye, so she makes shirts and her mom sells them online um, for her. 
these amazing people, right? I just told you a story from Sema, this one poster, right? And so, oh yeah, Jesse, that's the name, the name of the horse. <laughs> um, but uh, here is Elodia. She's a uh, past Kuyaki from the Sam Tribal Nation as Alex. Phenomenal leader um, there in our communities there in Southern Arizona. Um, but the language, um, Miyaki, you are valiant. That was the phrase that she wanted to put on her poster. I mean, give these posters to our young people, to our community members. Um, and then you are imaginative. This is actually a picture, a poster that I brought um, here. Oh, actually, yeah, I did, yeah, I did here. Um, so for those that are here in the space, like I brought pictures to you, you are imaginative. And this is the cactus, the great saguaro cactus that has many stories. Um, with the cactus, uh, it's crazy because if you have a passport, Look at page two. You will see the world, the Sonoran Desert in those photographs on your American passport. How special is that? Like, that's super cool. I'm like, out of all the places to put, we got placed on page two of our passport, you know? Like, that's such a cool story, you know? Like, um, you are loved. Um, that was on the poster that was for this, the flyer. Um, but look at it. This is through our sunrise ceremony that we had on campus. Um, you are brilliant. This is working with our friends at Raytheon, right? This was staged, right? <laughs> I was like, okay, like, right, you know, some of these things you do stage, people don't know it, you know, <laughs> but like, um, right, but even when you tell pictures and stories, like, what you wear, look at her bracelet, oh my gosh, if I could afford that something, that'd be so cool, um, you know, but like, and then Travis, I was like, man, can you wear a turquoise, like, <laughs> you know, a bracelet or something, but it tells us, it tells a story, though, right, when you see turquoise, it connects to our community, um, and so that that's something too. That, um, and then of course Daryl with his weekly on shirt on. Um, but uh, so Kyle, your life is sacred. Um, here's Maria. You are very beautiful. That's written in the Atom language and the name is the uh, Navajo language. Um, so again, yeah, just this expression of like your community, right? So if you're here at Buffalo, like again, think about the environment behind you, right? Like or. But you know, Niagara Falls, it was so amazing when we went yesterday. It's my second time going, but we went to Canada this time. And I could not believe the view on the Canadian side. Um, but we were just walking around and Alex and I were talking like how no matter what culture or where you come from, like we all come to take on this wonder that's here. That's like up the road from all of you. Like, man, that's such a powerful uh, sense of place there, no matter who you are, you know, like, and so kind of capturing, thinking about how do you capture the environment? I know as Indigenous people, the environment is extremely important, as well as a lot of other cultures too, right, like our Latinx community, like, language and culture is so important, and there's so many diverse communities, so considering that, I'm in New York College now, these are all the tribal um, flags from um, Arizona's nations, and this is our school of the University of Arizona. So very sunny. <laughs> it looks like a college California campus, actually. Um, so okay, so digital storytelling. I just want to show you a quick video. Um, this was actually made by Alex. And I uh, for graduate students, um, yeah, can you pull up the video for me, please? Um, there should be a tab up already. I didn't recognize the power of my voice until I was later on in my grad school program and my PhD program. And the way that this came about um, was that there was our president, our institution is about 45,000 students. And so we were outside one day taking pictures and the president came over and greeted us and said hi. Um, but he made some remarks that were rooted in macro, micro aggressive language. Uh, just Google President Robbins, high cheekbones, native store. You'll see what I'm talking about. Um, but this video was created. There was a group of us that came together to figure out how do we share our story as Indigenous students on a predominantly white campus. So Alex made this video. I'm going to share this here to honor Alex. And this is an awesome video. But... <laughs> Shug shan gam da na da, shug shan gam da na da. Wacha ari akima shuta kachim, sabinta gamya gamo hodi 
ging tonorik schukshan kam tonoda schukshan kam tonoda vacho ari akimashu takache sapin takam nya akam ho holding in tonorik Shukran kam tanoda, vacho ari akima shuta kachim. Sapinta kam yo kamo hodingin tanorik. Shukran kam tanoda, Vachari akima shuta kachim Sapinta kamya kamo hodingin tanorik Shukshan kam tanoda Vachari akima shuta kachim Okay, so what do you think about this film as the short film? <laughs> So short story, what are some of the reactions that you have to this two-minute story? At first, it seemed like such a mainstream campus. Mm. It's like, where would Native people fit? Mm -hmm. And then it was so weird. So this is the club wrestling program for the University of Arizona. Uh, we wrestled through the NCAA, which is the oh, National Association. <laughs> it was created in the 1980s for in Title IX. Be structures within our institution. We are trying to navigate these systems of oppression against indigenous people as well as other people of color. Um, our population is only one to two percent at the university and across the nation we only make up about two percent in higher education. So very very small population of white indigenous people in higher ed. Um, but as you can see there though, it was a space for us to share a story about our experience within the institution. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways you can go with that. And we were very methodical in how we went about that. It wasn't that, okay, so the president said these very harmful words to us. We could have gone on social media. We could have gone on TikTok. Was this in 2019? <laughs> no, no, I meant, I think it maybe just been overseas. We could have gone to YouTube or, or, you know, some of the other places and put them on blast. Like, he said this, he did this, you know, like we could have done that and we felt like doing it, but we didn't because we knew that, um, that we had to be very careful how we went about sharing our story in that context because it was the president of our institution, a very well-known person. Um, and so, so in a smaller context, we told him the offense, right? And then he apologized. And we told him, we want you to come to our class to apologize. So we reached out to the admin people, you know, tried to schedule this time, waited and waited, checked in, nothing. And so after three weeks, we're like, what the heck? Like, you know, we've tried, you know, we told him in person, uh, we tried to schedule and we're like, we're going to put this and share this with our community in a very public way. So we wrote a story, put it on social media, and then guess what? Guess who came and scheduled a meeting with us? <laughs> the president, <laughs> within like a few hours, you know, we were on his calendar for the next day, and we met him and talked with him, and guess who came to our class? <laughs> you know, like the president, right? So, but, but it was very, very intentional how we went about it. <clears throat> so again, it's this concept of digital caretaking of how you share your story, when you share it, who you share it with, and who you collaborate with, right? 
I, we're not always going to know the right answers at the right time every time, you know, like, um, it's interesting on TikTok, right? Actually, I'm going to say that's right for TikTok. So, yeah, so, uh, so this is um, an example, again, of storytelling. Um, but that was a very professionally well-made done video, right? And sometimes we, not, we may not have access to that all the time, which is okay, right? Because we have our phones, <laughs> right? Um, so this is uh, Native Stories is just an example. So in our curriculum within our class, what we do instead of a traditional like five to 10 page paper, a reflection paper, um, it's a service learning course, three unit. So um, we go through 16 weeks of course, at the very end, their final project is to create a three to five minute digital story sharing about their experience in our class um, and what they've learned as a student. Um, and so we give them the opportunity to create however they want you to, to create this video. Um, so a lot of students use their phones, honestly, and they'll just record themselves with their narrative. And so on our YouTube page, there are over 250 narratives of digital stories of our um, uh, undergraduate students reflecting on their experience. So if you design curriculum, if you um, engage with folks who want to share their story in this way, digital storytelling is an amazing platform to do it. And I've honestly just taught from the iMovie app um, on my phone or tablet. So very accessible. And again, if you have Snapchat, if you have like TikTok, you can just save those videos, right? And then just put them in like one story and you have a digital story about your day in the life of being a student, right? Or how you make coffee or whatever the topic is, you know, there's so many different angles you can go about that. So I just want to make sure that you know too that there's, if you have access to professional quality content, that's awesome. And if you have access to your phone, creating stories, that's really awesome too. So it's, it's very accessible when you think about storytelling in that way. All right, so with social media and TikTok, I'm going to share these quick TikTok stories really quick. <laughs> Okay, that was one. This is how you decolonize the academy. You hold your robe and you wear your Indian clothes loud and proud up on that stage. Ariana, Medina. One more. Ah, sorry. <laughs> What do you think about me as a storyteller? What do you just think about these stories? You want to offend me? Fearless. Fearless. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> what else? The middle one was the video I saw that made me think you as a big fan. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and that last one, when um, I hear Redbone, yes, it reminds me of how you know, this classic rock band from way back in the day would come out in powwow regalia in the middle of a mainstream rock concert. Mm -hmm. So you're drawing on the previous generation in your storytelling. Mm. Yes. <laughs> what else? Bold and colorful. Ah, okay, <laughs> proud. cool. Oh, okay, proud, okay, cool. Awesome, I'm glad this is how you, <laughs> the impression that, uh, we're getting from these videos here. Um, yeah, this one, all of us here are PhD graduates. Um, they're all my friends. <laughs> um, so we all graduated, except for Lydia. She is <coughs> phenomenal. Lydia, she's Pasco Yaki from um, Alejandro's community, but all of us graduated from the College of Education, except for Lydia. Um, she's a soil nerd. <laughs> so for those who may be interested in natural resources type of work in regards to indigenous communities, look her up on Twitter. It's just soil nerd, right? S-O-I-L, nerd, N-E-R-D, I believe is her handle. Phenomenal scholar. Um, but yeah, so we we just took a, we had a photo shoot one day. We're like, all right, let's meet here at this one place on campus. Let's bring your regalia, you know, your clothes, and let's take some pictures. And Alejandro took pictures of us that day. Um, so I was like, I'm going to put this on TikTok. Let's walk in slow motion. Um, and then let's uh, put a song on there and then just put for our people. And that was our story, right? The story here. We're here, right? I can't remember who mentioned that, but that we um, are scholars, right? We're, we're celebrating our indigenous community, even if you look at our regalia, it's so different, you know? The middle one, that one was the one that got the most views um, to this date so far. There was like 1.3 million views on this short TikTok. Um, I didn't realize the buzz that it would create. <laughs> um, I was just like there to just share, like when you decolonize the academy, 
Man, that gets people fired up. Like, <laughs> you know, they're like, what's wrong with the robe? And I'm like, nothing. It's not the robe. Like, you know, like it, it's the, the ideal of it, right? But you are standing up and sharing your story in a place that wasn't necessarily designed for us. That's the story. Some people get it, some people don't, right? And so, and that's okay. That, that's all right. Like, it's the dialogue that that is what's intriguing to me. The process of it. That's how you learn, right? Like, um, and so, and this last one, right? In our traditional regalia, just uh, an old maid uh, walking around, and I'm just like, I'm gonna put red bone. If you don't know, now you know, red bone is a. Uh, um, an indigenous band and so that song I think plays on like dating sites and like you know like it's just you know it's very, it is uh, multi-generational in terms of connecting that together um, but what I do love about TikTok is that it is multi-generational which is fascinating I think that TikTok is the most powerful social media platform that we have right now just as quickly as influencers can get followers, you can just quickly lose those followers. Um, right now, there's, oh my gosh, there's like a, I've heard a TikToker say a novella happening right now. You just Google Modern Warrior Chelsea, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But this very um, well-known TikToker, Modern Warrior, made some decisions. And now there's a lot of folks jumping in on the conversation. And it is uh there's so many angles in regards to how he decided decided to share stories and the people he was associated with so it's interesting because on his TikTok, there is a story um featuring one of our indigenous scholarship entities and i was like oh shoot like how would that reflect back on the scholarship entity even though he's associated with this drama you know so it's really interesting like sure he has a lot of followers he had three million i think it's down to like two point eight million so he lost like half a million followers over what's happening with his story and stuff and what he did and all this stuff but um but again it's thinking about how do you associate with people right and sometimes you just won't know you know and it's like when it's online oh the sad thing is that a lot of folks are using his old videos to come back and like you know it, it's just so again be very mindful of what you post like especially with young people when i work with like um you know like elementary school students like even my youngest sister, who's 10, I was like, what do you want to be when you grow up? She's like, I want to be a YouTuber, you know? And, and she watches, uh, what is that? Well, those ninjas, they're ninjas, they're YouTubers on, um, yeah, YouTube. Um, Spy Ninjas, that's what they're called. They're out of Vegas. But she watches Spy Ninjas, and they have all this merch, right? Like, they're just these people doing, like, things in Vegas, right? And she wants to be, she sees that and wants to be them. So with these young people, it's like, okay, that is wonderful. You want to share your story of being an influencer, but you got to know the risks and like the caretaking involved with being um, an influencer. So, um, so yeah, so I know that we're coming to the end of time here, but I just want to end, um, and I want to take time, time for some questions too, right? How many more questions? Or how many more, more minutes? Like 15 minutes? Yeah, minutes? like 15 minutes. Okay, cool. Um, so with the dissertation, um, this in particular is for um, our graduate students here. Um, the dissertation is fascinating process. Um, so this is the, the story of um, Indigenous runners. So when I was um, a first year PhD student, um, essentially the trauma that I experienced as a young person caught up to me at the age of 33 when I was um, a first year doc student. And that was very, very hard to navigate. Um, and I met with a counselor because for the first time I sought professional help. And I'm very open about this. It's actually written in my dissertation. The first 75 pages of my dissertation is my healing journey. And then I get into chapter one, like page 80 or something. So very unorthodox in terms of how I organize my dissertation, but it's designed in a very specific way. Um, and my committee was open to that too. So again, it's, you got to be careful how you pick your committee students <laughs> because they can they can really influence you and in how you share your story um but with uh this story though when i met with a um uh, a therapist initially at our school she said you know a great way to relieve stress is to exercise at least 30 minutes a day and so i was like okay i was like i'm gonna go running and uh, that's what i did running was a big part of my healing journey at that time and so when i was running and i was in a, a graduate course and um so i combined my healing journey, my love for running with my final project in that course. And so I wanted to learn uh, why do Indigenous people run? 
um, and how do they conceptualize their well-being within running, and how do they navigate the academy, uh, the university education life, um, in the scope and in, in the view of running. So that's kind of what I started out with in my project. So I created a 65-minute um, video, mainly using my phone and my GoPro, and I used um, uh, Final Cut Pro on my computer to bring it together. Um, but made this documentary that um, I, had, I had showcased at the um, a local community theater. Um, Alex showed one of his videos there, and there was about 300 people that came, which was super cool. And, um, but then that evolved into my dissertation. So very unorthodox journey in terms of like, okay, usually you go out and you're like, okay, what topic do I want to do? You know, let me get my lit review and all this stuff, right? But for me, it's centering my journey and as my story, like, that is where I began. Um, and these were the, the runners that I had um, interviewed, and Alex is one of them, too, with the hat. Um, so Alex is one of the runners in the journey. Um, and so the way that I designed it, my chapters, is that you're actually running through a marathon with me. So this graphic here, uh, your name here, all right, Richa, I thought about you when I was writing my dissertation, even though I didn't know you, but you did right there, right? Or, or Hillary, there you go, or Michelle, where I thought about all of you, <laughs> even though I didn't know you then, right? But it, it's this sense of like that you're engaging with this marathon journey with me in my dissertation. And that's the way that I wrote it. Dr. Amanda Tachini, who's also a Native scholar, she wrote her dissertation, this is what I used um, as her, like a format. She, she used it in terms of weaving a rug, which was important in her Diné culture, her Navajo culture. And she wrote her chapters like you were weaving a rug with her. So I used that same concept uh, of running a marathon, where chapter one was like, um, you know, preparing. I named all the chapters. I can't even give you all the chapter names right now. But essentially, it was like all preparing and running through a marathon. And so that's how the dissertation was. Um, created, and I created this well-being model. There's a lot of uh, well-being models, right, especially working with people, um, but I created my own model. What I did, too, was I was very intentional of how I shared my story. I hired a graphic designer. Um, she's Kiowa from Montana, um, and she, um, as you can see, even the PowerPoint threads that I have, right, the branding was important to me because I knew that the dissertation would go far beyond the, just the dissertation. So think about that too. When you share your story, like the branding of it is could be important, right? Like uh, maybe you're a graphic designer or know somebody who could like hook you up like for a package, right? If <laughs> you want to share your story, I don't know. That's what I did, right? Like, but um, I created my own well-being model here. And these were the elements that like helped me survive, honestly, help me get through, help me navigate. Um, Storytelling's on there. Oh my gosh, the Bible, I'm a Christian. That's a big part of my identity. Photography, videography, like this is all on my journey, right? So when you're working with people, an exercise you can do is like, okay, let's create your own well-being model. What are the core elements of that make you you, right? If they don't know, okay, well, let's talk about it. What do you like to do in your spare time? Oh, play video games or photography or whatever, like, um, you know, there's so many ways that you can use a well-being model to engage with people and understand where they're coming from and understand their story. Um, but welcome to the mind of Amanda Cheremiah. <laughs> so this is my, uh, uh, this is how I designed my uh, methodological approach. And so essentially, like, again, a graphic designer created this. But it all boils down to, honestly, for me, um, looking at, you know, this indigenous lens and this is how I um, formatted it. Uh, but there is one a particular um, concept called a cultural map. And so Dr. Gregory Cajete wrote an article in 2000. He asked an elder, he was like, how do you know how to go about life, how to make decisions? And he's like, I have a cultural map in my mind. He's like, that's how I know. So I ascribe to that. I believe that. And I know that I have a cultural map in my mind. That's how I know to go about things. Um, so now, though, I need to, I have to translate that cultural map <laughs> into the work that I do, right? And so um, that's a little bit about um, who it, what I do, but like in terms of like even language too, like instead of calling these figures, I call them indigenous narrative inference. Like before I look at this, I'm like, that's just not a figure. Like, man, that is like our people, <laughs> you know, like I can't call that a figure. Uh, and so now I just call it to make it even shorter the indigenous imprint. So when I do my work and even like the posters I make and stuff, I always say indigenous imprint. Like this is the indigenous imprint. <laughs> um, 
And uh, something else too is that, um, you know, kind of coining your own terms, like in Google, this is what I did too when I was doing my dissertation for students, you know, think about this. How can you coin something when you're writing, right? Like, and all you do is put it in parentheses and put it in there, like in Google, like, are there anybody, has anybody called this before? You know, like, um, and so that's like one term that I created, indigenous wide angle narrative approach. So that's in my dissertation. So there was no searches that popped up with that. I'm like, yes, I can come up with a new term, you know? So again, like making your mark. Um, but I think overall, like if you just, just remember that you have a precious story and that you are a storyteller. And as I brought prints here, um, you know, like I have stuff here, right? Here's a muskox. This is probably my favorite one. Never seen a red where the wild things are. This reminds me of something like that, <laughs> like a creature out of like, I mean, this creature is out of the ice age. I took this in Alaska. This was taken with my phone. So here's a quick tip using the rule of thirds. Imagine a tic-tac-toe board with the subject on one of the lines. That's a quick, that'll, that'll up your Instagram great game in a second. <laughs> Use the rule of thirds there. Um, another concept here, the rule of thirds. Here's Kyle, right, playing with light. Um, in terms of his hat, again, that rule of thirds. I think I use rule of thirds in all my stuff. Here's another cactus. <laughs> that rule of thirds in the Sonoran Desert, that's what our sunsets look like. If you ever want to come down, let me know. You can go see a sunset. <laughs> um, here's another sunset. Oh, yeah, look at this rule of thirds. That's all I do, I guess. Um, playing with light. Um, this is in Hawaii. This is Canna Point. Um, here's another story. Um, when I went there for a spring break trip one time, we had a cultural exchange with the indigenous people there. Um, at this point in Oahu, on the western tip, uh, this point, Kiana Point, um, over here in the water in the area, um, we were told the story that it's their, um, the beginning of their way to heaven, like their heaven. So it's such a cool, a cool narrative. Um, very precious story. Um, this is a Havasupai. Oh my goodness, I love Havasupai. This is Mooney Falls. Um, at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, there's a community called Havasupai. Uh, this is one of the waterfalls that are there. They're, they're known as people of the blue-green water. Right here's my mom. What another photography tip? What takes what's in the background matters. It could be tell a really cool story. This was my great grandpa's truck that was restored by my uncle. So when uh, my mom went there, my great grandpa, she loved my great grandpa. And uh, taking a picture of her soul and regalia was extremely important. Remember, my mom doesn't want to be seen, so it's just like, don't take a picture of her head. <laughs> it, still, it still tells a story, though, right, of her jewelry and of where she's at. Um, and then last but not least, oh, yeah, here's another one. But looking at light, looking at how you can frame subjects, too, is really cool. I use, um, what do you call this, Akatio, um, a desert plant there. And then the last one here, our campus event before COVID, was a ceremonial sunrise ceremony at one campus. I use lines a lot in my photography. So think about natural lines that may form in nature or in architecture. That's also another photography tip for you. Um, but yeah, so there's just so many ways you can share your narrative. But I would say overall, I'm always on the side where you should amplify your narrative as whatever identity you want to. I think that's very precious and very special. So with that, uh, let's take any questions here in these last few minutes. Um, but yeah, any thoughts or... There's a lot that I shared with all of you. <laughs> There's my contact info too. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions, thoughts? So powerful. I really appreciate the strength of your stories mm -hmm. and how you encourage us to tell our stories. Don't be defined by someone else. As you showed those three pictures largely around graduation, mm -hmm. it reminded me of some difficulties that we have had here in Buffalo. Mm. And I also went back to a really early reference that you had of the boarding schools and talked about how surveilled mm. that population was. Yeah. And I believe that as Indigenous people in education, we are still subject to surveillance. Mm -hmm. We had a graduation here a number of years ago. Some of you who have been around may remember 
we had a Native student at our social work graduation who chose to wear a gestoa, which is the traditional male headdress. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had the normal Western graduation robe or whatever it is, but he expressed himself. Well, we had surveillance. We had a police presence mm -hmm. as well as a strong university administrative response to what we were doing and we just wanted to celebrate a native mm -hmm. student graduating and it was important to him to express who he was yeah i knew how i felt about it when i saw that graduation and when i saw the police presence only in recent years did i hear that graduate speak about his memories I didn't, re I thought the police were a little bit more discreet. I didn't realize what an imprint that had more than a decade later and how painful that ongoing surveillance is when we express our pride. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if there were more thoughts you had for us on how to remain strong despite surveillance, mm -hmm. how to continue telling our story and expressing ourselves mm -hmm. when somebody doesn't think we should have that story. Yeah. Somebody thinks we should look and act just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, that's a really good question. I, I think that, um, you know, as a collective, it, I, I, and what I do comes from a collective a lot of times, and it is finding people who are for you and who understand you, that when you come together, you figure out how do you, how do you make this imprint, right? Like, maybe it's like, when we were going through that time where there was a lot of resistance that we felt on campus, you know, like we made shirts like that were printed and we got money to help print those shirts that said Voices of Indigenous Concerns in Education. We would wear those when we spoke to our Arizona Board of Regents uh, at the university, like that oversee all the three state institutions. Um, we went to these spaces. It was so scary. <laughs> like talking to these people in these big wig suits who are like millionaires who are on these boards, right, or regents that on our in our state. We would go as a team, and we would we would sign up for the free speech like second. We would have like three minutes to talk or something. Um, we would all collectively go and do that in these high profile, high visible spaces. And it was scary a lot of times. I was, I love public speaking and I was so afraid in those times, you know, but a lot of times it's that collective, like that, that I feel like I have to have the blessing of the collective in order to be able to do some things. There's a lot of advisors that I, I work with and have and mentors. I think that on campus, we were going through the whole thing with the president. The faculty who were non-native were so helpful to us. Like the the staff who were non-native were so helpful. Like we had to have these partners in other parts of campus that that were would help fight for us too. So finding those like key faculty members, key staff members that are like down for the people, you know, you know who they are. <laughs> like, you know, like, you know, they will be with you, they will stand with you, they will those, especially those who have tenure too, right? Like that can stand up in these different ways and who will like gosh they're so valuable you know so i think you gotta you have to find those other people like you can't i don't think you can do it by yourself because it, it can be very um challenging and very lonely if you do it by yourself so i think this work right in regards to race or regards to macro microaggression that's hard work like and you can get drained very quickly you know and so I think the key is longevity. You know, you want to be here for the long run. And in order to do that, you have to be a collective. Yes. Um, I really want to thank you for being here first. And I think, you know, your perspective is very empowering and very inspiring because when I look at, when I hear indigenous lens, I think about indigenous lens who all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and like, you know, many indigenous folks from around the world and all the continents have been trying to tell their stories, but the Western media has been pushing back and telling a story yeah. to them that is not true to their identity, what's going on. Um, so that really resonated with me. Yeah. But uh, yeah, this could be really big and
comments online or anything. Uh, appreciation for sharing your story with us and and uh, letting letting the audience see you. Mm. Yeah. And I'd love to engage with all of you in other ways too. Like um, again, my contact information is there. If you want to connect, TikTok or Twitter or whatever, <laughs> please. Um, again, these platforms are so powerful. But um, but you know, I, and also too, I, I want to give a couple of gifts too. So Teresha, thank you so much for having me here. I got earrings. Um, yeah, and then uh, Michelle and Hillary also got you some scarves too. Um, so here, oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so I'll give this to you later, but thank you so much for hosting me. Um, these scarves are, are really important um, to our native people and, and beyond. Um, if you look on TikTok, there's a lot of stories about the Popo scarf um, and how Ukraine, um, back in the day when they connected with our indigenous people here in North America, how the scarves were an uh, important piece of trade. Um, and now they significant a lot throughout so many indigenous communities throughout our country. Yeah. That story was just on CBC National oh, last night. I saw okay. it. And wow. also a comment too about yeah. you bringing the digital um, arena, mm -hmm. uh, making it accessible. And I think also like elevating this is an important way and also a cheap way mm -hmm. to uh, communicate. Mm -hmm. Yes. A question for, yes. Uh, time for Alejandro too. Like, is there anyone you're interacting with down there? And are you interested in like getting into film and TV? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think in terms of film, I, I wonder, like, because I did create that 65 minute story and that was a lot of work. <laughs> and there was, yeah. a, you know, I was there with my little GoPro, you know, like, right. you know, and my phone and stuff. Like, I, I think there's an interest, there's always an interest to become more visible. That definitely is um, a goal of mine. Now, in terms of film and movies, I'm not quite sure how that would work here. Social media is kind of giving me that ability right. to dabble a little bit especially TikTok, um but maybe that's down the way somewhere like yeah. I, I enjoy writing now like i didn't like writing before my dissertation yeah. but now i like it now and being able to tell a story in writing is pretty cool transfer it to video is really good. i'm i'm a i'm a storyteller as well oh. I, i'm a writer and oh, i'm cool. very interested in like i'm a film nerd and tv nerd and i don't know a lot and i'm not saying that out there but I don't cool. know of a lot of stories that are from mm -hmm. an indigenous perspective. Like you see, like the show yeah. 83 out right now, it's all through a white perspective. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those shows and movies aren't. So it's like, yeah, I mean, just interested to see, like, yeah, what that is. Yeah, for sure. You should connect with Alejandro. He's definitely, he's the filmmaker too right now. So, yeah. What, well, what's your name? PJ. PJ, all right. How do I get touched? You're like, what are you on? Are you on Instagram or? Yeah. Just there. So, yeah, there's so few of us. We all know each other a long time. So. Yeah, very small. <laughs> so, yeah, very small community. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're good on time right now. All right. Thank you so much again to our, our hosts, our friends, for having me and Alex and sharing this space with all of you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.